mention Guam. A thermonuclear weapon is maybe one megaton. So your standard garden variety hydrogen bomb that's never been used in wartime is produced by something that's, well, around the size of this building, hitting the earth. A hundred megaton bomb. I am not sure the human race has ever built a bomb that big. That's produced by something a hundred meters across, which is pretty small. And on and on and on. <laughs> up here we're up to a, uh, a million megatons. Well, how, how often do we expect collisions like this? This diagram was done, this guy ran through a an estimate of how often we expect a collision like that. But I want to warn you that that estimate was done this estimate I'm showing you here was done back when we didn't know about very many asteroids. This estimate was done sometime in here when we didn't know very many asteroids. Now we know of a lot more. So there's going to be more collisions than what I'm about to show you. This is how often they happen. Every hour Every hour, there's a collision with a meteor around the meteor across, around the yard across. Every year, there's a collision that releases around one megaton. Now, most of that happens up in the atmosphere of the Earth. It doesn't involve an explosion that reaches the ground. Every century, we get something, and this is labeled Siberia. This is this weird thing in Tunguska. Tunguska. Uh, just for those people who are not, in Tunguska is a region of Siberia, way up north, way out in the boondocks, where I believe it was early in the 20th century. 1908. You guys know more than I do. Anyway, for the two people here who don't know all about it, uh, there, it's right here. Anyway, there, there was a. Uh, a big explosion. And it was way out far away. It took a long time for people to get there. When people got there, they found all the trees had been knocked down like this. They were all charred as if they had been seared by a blast of heat. When they got to actually ground zero, the trees were not knocked over. They were standing straight up. But all the branches had been sheared off them. There was no hole in the ground. Clearly, some blast of super heavy air had come straight down and then splashed outwards. Uh, something had hit, broken apart in midair, uh, completely busted up into pieces so that no solid anything ever hit the ground, but this jet of superheated air had come down, sheared the branches off the trees, charred the bark, splashed outwards. And very roughly, the estimate was that that was the sort of thing that happens once every century. The estimate is that every hundred million years, something maybe eight kilometers across lands produces a crater a hundred kilometers across. That's the kind of an event that wiped out the dinosaurs. Sixty-five million years ago, well, the, the KT boundary, the Cretaceous Tertiary boundary in the geological record, the dinosaurs just suddenly went extinct. And it was not just the dinosaurs, but a huge number of species went extinct. Uh, and they went extinct over the whole world. We've actually found the crater. It's the Chicxulub crater. Uh, half of it is on the Yucatan. The other half is underwater in the Caribbean. Uh, it's this enormous crater. Uh, the asteroid landed in Mexico and dinosaurs in Africa went extinct. So it was a worldwide catastrophe. If that were to happen to us, it would be a worldwide catastrophe for the human race and for many other species. Every hundred million years. Okay, so this is the situation. Oops, no, we don't want that. Can we turn on lights again? <laughs> So, all right, that's the point. The point is, 
type catastrophe. Of course, it's going to be more open than that, because now we know there are more asteroids than that estimation. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? This is one of these things. Do I want to buy insurance for my house to protect against, uh, you know, an airplane flying overhead and a suitcase falls out of the airplane and lands and lights a fire that burns up my garage? The chances of that happening are minimal. Well, the chances of this happening are minimal. But if it does happen, it's not just that you and I will be hurt. It's that all of industrial civilization will be annihilated. It's that not just humanity will come to an end, but maybe every dog and cat and frog, people will come to an end. Probably not. It will probably not be true that all life on Earth will be wiped out. The extinction of the dinosaurs didn't wipe out all living things. As a matter of fact, it, killing off the dinosaurs made room for mammals. You know, mammals existed during the age of the dinosaurs, but there were not very many mammals. And once the dinosaurs were gone, the mammals took over. So, it's not the end of life on the Earth, but it's going to be bad. It's going to be horrible. So, what do you do about it? What do you do about it? There are some people who argue, all right, let's just think about that. Suppose that tomorrow we get up and we read in the newspaper that somebody has discovered a near-Earth asteroid, an asteroid in a Earth-crossing orbit, which is on a collision course with the Earth, which is going to hit. It's now out in the asteroid belt. <coughs> How long will it take for us to get ready for it? Well, it takes two or three years for something to get here from the asteroid belt. That means we got two or three years to do something about it. What do you propose to do about it? Well, whatever it is, it's going to be hard. So, these people argue that we should get ready now. We should get ready before it's discovered. Once it is discovered, it's too late. What could you do? Well, we'd have to build a rocket, send a rocket out towards the asteroid, and then do something when we get to it. Now, these asteroids are around 10 kilometers across. What would you want to do to an asteroid to protect us from it? Well, I want to give it a little sideways push. You've got this big lump. It's just drifting, okay? It's just drifting towards us minding its own business. If a, we, I showed you those pictures of asteroids. Each of those pictures were taken by a space probe that got kind of close to the asteroid. So I guess what I want to do is take a space probe, put it real close to the asteroid, have it land on the asteroid, and then fire its rocket engine, pushing the asteroid sideways. How big of a push do you need to give an asteroid so that it's going to miss us? I worked out the numbers about that. Kind of amazing. You have to give it a one and a half mile an hour sideways motion. 1.5 miles per hour this way, and it'll miss the Earth. That's because it's just it's got a long way to go before it gets here. So you give it even a little tiny sideways motion, it'll miss us. So that's not very fast. On the other hand, an asteroid is very heavy. It's like pushing on an aircraft carrier. It's even worse than that. So it would be pretty hard to do that. Furthermore, it takes our space probe a certain amount of time to get to the asteroid. It takes the asteroid a couple years to get here. It takes the space probe a couple years to get to the asteroid. So if we discovered an asteroid heading in tonight, and launch the space probe at it tomorrow morning, they might meet six months later, somewhere out in space. Maybe the thing to do is to try to blow up the asteroid. Oh, that is, the space probe is not going to be, let us say, something that's just going to be a sideways push. Maybe you should blow it up. Uh, that's a pretty big thing to blow up. The best way to do it might be a nuclear weapon. At the moment, there's an international treaty that forbids this. There's an international treaty that forbids any nuclear weapons in space. If we found an asteroid coming in tonight and wanted to launch a nuclear weapon, we'd have to get an agreement from all the nations of the world that have signed this treaty that, yes, it's OK 